Okay, we're live on the air. We don't have anybody in the uh, in the class this evening, but I'm going to go ahead and get started here and record this. I think a few people are a little delayed. They'll start here very shortly. And um, tonight, uh, we're going to cover topics 13 and 15. We're going to skip over topic 14. Topic uh, 13 deals with electrical principles. Uh, topic 15 uh, deals with good grounds. Uh, both of those are still along the same topic. And the reason I'm skipping uh, topic 14, which uh, deals with uh, uh, circuits, is because topic 14 is about uh, 89 uh, slides long. And the two I'm going to cover tonight are significantly shorter and should cover the time we have set aside for this evening's session. Uh, if you recall, uh, last session, uh, number six, we covered uh, the receiver and oscillators and components. A lot of this should not be foreign to you. I mean, uh, if you've passed your technician class license, uh, most of this is just going to be kind of a rehash of what you learned in your tech class license. It's a little bit more advanced, and there are some good websites out there that if you want to know more about electrical principles and circuits and things like that, uh, you can uh, definitely uh, uh, peruse those as well. Uh, there is a website called Slide Player that uh, has a fairly decent. Um, uh, slideshow in and of itself covering electrical principles. And uh, if you want that, just drop me an email, wayne at n3lms.net. Wayne, n3lms.net. So we have one person joining now. Good evening, Cohen. How are you? Good. Good evening. All righty. I was just getting ready. I'm just covering uh, the topics uh, with the live broadcast at this point uh, of what we're doing. And uh, if you got my email, you know that uh, we're not going to cover 14 tonight. So, at any rate, uh, I'm going to mute your, uh, your microphone. Since I am uh, broadcasting live, I'm going to get started with the... Uh, with the thing. If you don't, do you have any questions tonight, Cohen, before I get started? I am. Right. I'm good. Okay. I'm good. All right. Good deal. Well, you can see there that we have Herman Munster at 1313 Mockingbird Lane. <laughs> that would be his QSL card. And this is the general class license course. So starting on page 133 in your book, we will be uh, begin our electrical principles here. I don't know what this dude is doing here in the lower left-hand corner with uh, his little voltmeter and asking himself a question of what will happen if I short the voltage out with a conductor. Well, we kind of know what will happen with that. <laughs> so anyhow, we're going to roll right along here and uh, and get going. So... We're talking about the uh, RMS voltage uh, that would appear across a 50 ohm dummy load and dissipating 1200 watts here. And when you work with HF mobile antennas, um, a high, high frequency dummy load, uh, you may wish to calculate the voltage across it to make sure things won't arc over or to determine the maximum voltage that can be applied across the load without exceeding its power rating. So in this question, we're looking for voltage, and we have a resistance, of course, in ohms and power in watts. And if you remember your uh, little ohms law wheel, okay, uh, and the relationship between watts, amperes, ohms, and volts, this is a, a fairly easy, uh, easy answer here. Again, this is simple stuff like you've covered in your tech class. Uh, material before. It's always a good idea to have a little bit of electrical knowledge, uh, at least the basics down. And um, I encourage everyone to just, you know, try to pr uh, continue on with uh, increasing your knowledge, pick the brains of fellow hams, find information on the internet, whatever. Um, 
But uh, the more knowledge you know, the better understanding you'll have of the electrical principles. A lot of hams will get into this. And again, you heard me say that some of them are armchair or appliance operators. And they just, they want to get their license. They want to operate. They don't want to care about how the radio operates or if something goes wrong, how to troubleshoot it or anything like that. That's not the case in every instance. There's a lot of knowledgeable hams out there. If you're part of a club, they'll definitely help you with, um, you know, troubleshooting and uh, getting uh, the the fineries down of electrical principles and why your radio might be operating the way it is. At any rate, when you consult that magic circle that I had up there a little bit ago, uh, we find the relationship for voltage when we have resistance and power to be E is equal to the square root of power times resistance. And you can see the formula there. So it's an easy one to work out on your calculator. And predominantly what you're going to do is you're going to take the uh, the ohmage 50 times 1200 equals 60,000. Uh, now simply tap the square root sign and voila, the correct answer pops up, uh, which is approximately 245 volts. And this shows up as answer B on your exam. Uh, one thing to note, uh, examiners are allowed to scramble the ABCD order, so look for 245 volts as the correct answer. If you look on page 132, there is the magic circle there. I just had it up on the uh, screen, of course. But um, in this question, uh, there are He's saying to uh, consult that circle for the proper answer here. Um, P is equal to E squared divided by resistance in ohms. Um, e squared, in this case, you, there's 400 volts um, squared, which is 160,000 divided by uh, 800. Uh, where'd they get the 800 ohms? Oh, okay, where'd I miss this? I got to change pages here. Okay. The question asks if there's 400 volt DC is supplied to an 800 ohm line lead. I apologize. I didn't catch that right off the bat. So again, yeah, that's very, uh, very true. You're going to divide by the uh, resistance of 800 and the answer is 200. So your keystrokes are uh, 400 times 400 divided by 800 equals 200, 200 watts. For this next one, we're looking at a 12 volt DC light bulb that draws 0.2 amperes. Definitely uh, something a little bit uh, lower than what we were dealing with in the previous one. Again, you multiply volts times amps and you end up with 2.4 watts um, when you consult the little circle there that tells you that. So your, your keystrokes are gonna be 12 times 0.2 equals 2.4 in watts. Remember the uh, relationship, I don't, I, at least I hope you do, the relationship of uh, uh, the voltage if you're, and as far as Ohm's law is concerned, if you visualize E over I R, uh, I times R would give you, or the, um, the current times resistance gives you the voltage. Uh, if you want to find resistance and you know current and voltage, you're going to divide current into voltage. If you want to know current, you know voltage and resistance, you're going to divide resistance into voltage, and that's going to give you the current. Um, power, uh, is, uh, again, let me just go ahead and throw this up here again. This, um, oh, little magic circle anyway. Do, 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 do. Where is it? There it is. So if you understand the magic circle, you have a very good understanding of how to calculate the known variables to get the unknown. Um, if you want to know watts, if you know voltage and resistance, 
there's your formula for that. If you know current and resistance, your formula. If you know voltage and current, there's your formula right there. And I get, all three of those will give you the power of in watts. And you can follow this along throughout the, uh, the circle there. Pretty easy stuff, really. Okay, unless metric prefixes are second nature to you, uh, we always recommend converting everything to fundamental units before doing any calculations. It can be very confusing, especially in the heat of an exam to work with mixed units, such as millis, micros, and kilos, all in the same formula. In this case, we have 7.0 milliamps, which translated is you're going to move that decimal point over three spaces to the left if it's milli. So you have really 0 0.007 amperes. Likewise, if you have 1.25 kiloohms, move that a little bit uh, to the right, uh, and you get uh, 1,250 ohms. So now use the current and resistant ver uh, resistance version of the magic circle for the equation. Power is equal to current squared times resistance. In this case, power is equal to 0 0.007 times 1250. And this gives you the answer in wattage, which is 0 0.06125 watts. And of course, if you move that over the decimal point to the right, uh, three three places, you come out with 61 milliwatts. And there's your keystrokes on that. Again, the fundamental units make it a little bit easier in figuring these out. Once you understand the relationship between the fundament, fundamental uh, units and um, the uh, subunits, milliampers to ampers, Kiloohms to ohms. Once you understand that, it becomes very easy to uh, multiply and divide and do all the calculations necessary to come up with the answer. All right, RMS simply means root mean square, and it's a measurement of an AC signal, also called the effective value of an AC voltage. And it is the same as a DC voltage uh, at, of the same value, basically. Here in this little chart, you see that uh, the root mean square or the RMS value of an AC voltage is about 0 .0, or 0 .707. Uh, remember, we kind of worked with that before, uh, knowing what 0 .707, just kind of locking that in your, in your brain as a value. Um, and along with that, the uh, doubling of that, which is 14.1 or 1.414, that would be your peak to peak. So RMS uh, voltage, peak voltage, and peak to peak voltage is shown here in this chart. All right, looking at uh, G5B09, <clears throat> We're wanting to know what the RMS voltage of a sine wave with a value of 17 volts peak is going to be. So it's a very simple formula if you work it backwards. From the formula shown in the figure for RMS value, we see the peak voltage, and uh, which is the value we have in the question, and it's equal to 1.414 times RMS voltage, and the value uh, the question is asking for. Uh, so here you have the 1.414 times voltage in root mean square. You're uh, predominantly what you're doing here, if you have, what is it, 17 volts, is equal to 1.414 times voltage in RMS. To, uh, to find this, okay, you want to find voltage. RMS is equal to 17 divided by 1.414, which is equal to 12 point, you know, and some digits there, or about 12 volts. So that is the RMS voltage of a 17 volt peak 
uh, voltage value. Come on, change a slide here. There we go. Okay, the switching power supply uses a relatively HF or high frequency oscillator at a frequency where small, lightweight, low cost miniature transformers create relatively smooth DC power output. I'm personally not a big fan of switching power supplies. Um, they, uh, I mean, they're, they're probably better these days. In the earlier days, they weren't really they, so quiet. They actually caused problems, I think. So I've never really been a fan of switching power supplies personally. Um, they've come a long way with switching power supplies, and maybe I might get one someday. And uh, instead of one of the big bulky ones that I have now. <laughs> but uh, if you look in your book on page 135, you can see uh, this little uh, the picture of a little jet stream uh, uh, switching power supply there, and they're fairly compact, and they use uh, some smaller, like a lightweight, low-cost miniature transformers to uh, to take your AC power and turn it into 12 volts. Yeah, the large, heavy, traditional transformer. These things are like boat, an boat anchors. Um, a note of caution here is the concern of the switching power supply uh, in its proximity to your HF antenna system. The antenna system must be 10 feet or more away from the switching power supply so that broadband noise from the unit is not picked up by the antenna. Again, like I say, this is one of the reasons I'm not uh, a fan of them is because they can cause noise. Uh, within proximity of your radio, or they used to be able to. Now, the only caution they're saying here is that uh, the antenna, and it, it's not likely that you're going to have your antenna within 10 feet of your switching power supply anyway. So for that, it's not really a huge concern. Okay, electrical principles under G7A05. The half wave rectifier uses only half of the cycle. Now, we've talked about the full wave bridge rectifier and um, the portion of AC that is converted to DC in a half wave rectifier is only one half of the cycle. And if you look at that diagram there, you can see that. The way this is set up on the output of the transformer is it's got one forward bias diode. And as this cycles through, it creates that uh, voltage, which is conveyed through the inductor and uh, through the um, corresponding uh, dielectric that's in there to the secondary winding. And it's only picking up this portion this portion is not even coming through at all because it can't reverse back through this single diode. It only goes forward one way, and uh, this is the resulting waveform. So it's really kind of a pulse uh, type DC signal, and it only conducts on the positive cycle. There's nothing on the negative. And that really will not work so much with powering your radio equipment. There's a little bit more to this that has to be done in order to give you a nice, clean DC signal converted from AC from the primary to the secondary winding on the transformer. And in that same vein, we're going to talk about the full wave rectifier, which actually converts uh, the entire AC signal or the AC uh, cycles. Uh, and it uses all 360 degrees of the AC cycle. So the output of a full wave rectifier also is much easier to filter to provide a more uh, pure DC voltage. There is a diagram in here, um, which we're going to deal with in uh, as we look 
at some subsequent questions here. A full wave rectifier gives a much smoother pulsating DC than a half wave rectifier because the full wave rectifier uh, has rectified uh, half si uh, has rectified the entire cycle of the AC line input um, and it's double the frequency of the AC line input. I hope it didn't confuse anybody there. Because we'll make it clear right here. So the full wave bridge rectifier circuit offers an output of pulsating DC that is far easier to smooth out than either a single diode half wave circuit or a two diode full wave center tap rectifier. Uh, yeah, there is a uh, two diode full wave center tap rectif rectifier, which is really not recommended. So in this diagram, you see the full wave bridge rectifier as being comprised of four diodes. And uh, the full wave bridge develops a peak inverse voltage across the four diodes that is nearly equal to the normal peak output power of the power supply. And you'll see there in that diagram, it takes the positive side, the, uh, the positive up stroke of the cycle, and feeds it into here into this part and then it takes the negative really on the other side it, it's i don't i this is a little this diagram's a little strange to me but the other side as it goes down onto the negative side it actually converts it to a positive as you see here but it takes it, it let's, i'm going to back up here and kind of show this a little bit differently you see this this is the this is shown across here as a positive, a pulsating DC. The bottom is this is taken out. It's it's not even conducted through uh, to uh, to your load at all. But what a full wave bridge rectifier does is it takes this portion right here, this negative portion, this downward side, and it converts it to a more positive. And it feeds it back in here. And of course, this block, this cycle is blocked by this diode. This signal is blocked by this diode, so it can't feed back. And it, both of them feed right here into this little point here. And then you have a choke to aid in filtering. And you have capacitors that, if you remember, capacitors hold a little bit of, an, a, of a charge and it'll smooth out that full wave bridge so that you have a complete positive output here from this side and this side and this is your negative side right here the bleeder resistor what that does when you power off um, while the power is on these capacitors are always going to hold a little bit of a charge and when you power off this bleeder resistor, what it does, especially if you're going to put your fingers in there, you don't want to get a shock from any residual voltage that these capacitors are storing. The bleeder resistor will bleed off that excess voltage very slowly until there is no potential or charge on these capacitors whatsoever. As we continue to talk about the half-wave rectifier power supply, uh, the voltage across that uh, hard-working rectifier is two times the normal peak output voltage. So the smoothing output capacitor will hold the peak voltage during the negative half of the cycle while the transformer is at the negative peak, letting the rectifier see twice the normal peak output voltage across it. So when it asks you the question about what is the peak inverse voltage across the rec rectifier in this half wave uh, power supply, it is twice the normal peak output voltage. In power supplies, transformers supply the voltage and current and diodes rectify and capacitors and, and inductors provide the filtering uh, component 
and process. And a bleeder resistor protects, okay, your especially your body. Uh, when you look inside, if you happen to look inside your power supply, you have an inductor, which is a coil of wire that opposes AC current trapped in its magnetic field. And you'll see that your radio has quite a few number of those. So capacitors and inductors help with filtering. There's a couple pictures of some, um, these are polarized can capacitors, um, uh, otherwise known as electrolytic capacitors as well. So we'll find these in the power supply section of most radios. Uh, they have to be put in a particular way. They're not ceramic, uh, but they are polarized and they have to be uh, inserted in the proper polarization, negative to negative, positive to positive. So the electro electrolytic capacitor uh, being polarized offers high capacitance for a given volume. Okay, volume equals size. So they do hold a fair amount of uh, capacitive charge to better smooth out the DC uh, component. Without these capacitors and without the inductors, even a full wave bridge rectifier, you'll have a little bit of ripple in the signal, not really smooth. Uh, with that little ripple, it could also cause a little bit of noise in your receiver and also could also uh, uh, project some noise uh, out on your transmitted signal. So if somebody says you have a hum on your radio, uh, you've turned on your power supply, you got your two meter radio going and you might have a little bit of a hum on it, um, it's possible that maybe one of your capacitors and some of the filtering circuits could uh, be failing inside your power supply. Most electrolytic capacitors are polarized, meaning they care deeply about which way you wire them up. Of course, I just covered this, so um, <laughs> you haven't lived until you've been shot by an exploding metal can, wet slug tantalium uh, capacitor, and uh, they bear a striking resemblance to blasting caps, have approximately the same effect, especially if they're wired up backwards. So make sure you check, check the polarity before installing them in any circuit. And uh, if, uh, according to this, whatever questions are on this uh, or possible selection of answers for this question, all of the choices are correct. And uh, you'll see that electrolytic capacitors are clearly marked for polarity. There's a little, there's a little plus sign right there. When you turn off your big rig it, rig, it dims down and then cycles off completely. This slow decay of voltage is from the filter capacitors that are slowly being discharged by the bleeder resistors. And this is a safety feature uh, that also helps provide regulation. We're gonna see an illustration here on uh, page 136, let's see. If you look back on page 136 for G7, you see that bleeder resistor that I pointed out earlier. Okay, your buddy discovers you are a brand new general and gives you several gel cell 12 volt batteries to see which one has the absolute best charge. Use a digital voltmeter to get a more precise digital readout of the battery voltage. So a neat little analog voltmeter might not show you subtle changes in battery terminal voltage, however. And uh, it's nice to have a, uh, have a voltmeter on hand um, to, uh, to make sure that you can check things and make sure that the proper voltages are there. Um, next question, you'll see that what a voltmeter looks like on page 138. I have several of them here. I think I showed them during the tech class license course. Um, now one of the uh, one of the most cherished 
multimeters out there is an old Simpson model uh, 260 needle meter. I loved my needle meter. Unfortunately, it was stolen. <laughs> and uh, one thing I really liked about my uh, about my uh, needle meet meter is that it had a, a little mirror built into it so that I could actually see more accurately by lining up that needle instead of looking off at one side or another. If I looked at that needle and it was perfectly lined up with the uh, image in the mirror, I know that what that needle was reading was the proper reading and I wasn't off uh, by any measure. So the analog needle movement can give you the feel visually of tuned circuits as long as that particular tuned circuit does not call for specialized non-loading measurements. Um, that's one of the things about these analog meters. Uh, may also be less effective by strong nearby signals up at a repeater site too. Yeah, that's the thing. That, that needle, much like a compass, would be affected by the magnetic fields uh, you know, that's produced around the Earth. If you have magnetic uh, electromagnetic fields nearby it could actually throw off your uh, reading uh, by swaying that needle a little bit new digital voltmeters have a relatively high input impedance to avoid loading down the circuit being measured that was one of the things about the analog meter is that uh, if you're trying to measure circuits that are particularly sensitive uh, to loading, you may not get an accurate measurement uh, that you need. And as circuitry has become more and more sophisticated over the years, the digital meters uh, have come out and they provide a, uh, a measure of input impedance that is less likely to load down the circuit and give you a more accurate reading uh, of what you're trying to measure there. When operating your equipment with a 12 volt lead acid automobile battery during field day, make sure you never pull your battery below 10.5 volts. Uh, you'll notice that a lot of times people will have, uh, hams will have a meter attached to their battery and they're keeping an eye on that. And if they're transmitting and it pulls that battery below 10.5 volts, it's time to charge that battery because you really don't want to cause a condition that will shorten the life of your battery. And it's always best, and this is the thing I've always used, don't use a standard car battery. I really recommend not using a standard car battery. Um, I do recommend using a deep cycle, typically they're marine batteries, but using a deep cycle battery will uh, last a lot longer than a standard automobile battery if it happens to dip below 10.5 volts. So an indication that you're reaching that minimum is that any transmitter running at 10.5 volts, 10.5 volts, uh, Da, 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 excuse me, I got a little distracted. Instead of 12 volts, usually there's distortion on the HF frequencies. Disposable flashlight D cells are never intended to be recharged. And I know that uh, occasionally you can find some things out there in the uh, wide world. Uh, internet that say they will charge a standard d cell battery and things like that yeah it's not really a good idea to do that your attempts to recharge a carbon zinc primary cell or even the newer alkaline batteries may lead to the battery venting dangerous gas so unless the battery specifically states rechargeable do not try to recharge it get some leakage you know when you if you happen to manage to recharge a battery even just for a, a, a small uh, amount and you put it back in your equipment uh, 
there is the potential for that recharged battery to leak. It's bad enough that you have a battery that leaks even that hasn't been recharged and it messes up your equipment and uh, makes a complete mess. The nickel cadmium or shortened as NICAD battery is a low cost rechargeable voltage source for handheld radios as well as for some QRP or low power output HF transceivers. The low internal resistance of the NICAD battery allows for high discharge current when transmitting. The disadvantage of low internal resistance is a slight self-discharge between uses of your radio equipment. So before you go out on field day, be sure to cycle your nickel cadmium battery pack several times and in the cycle with a good charge. One thing to note about NICAD batteries is that they have a propensity to develop a memory. And what I mean by that is if you start out with a fully charged NICAD battery and you go out or a battery pack, let's put it that way, and you have it in your radio and you go out and you transmit and you're using your radio and everything. And um, maybe uh, at the end of the day, you've probably discharged about half of the nickel cadmium uh, uh, battery uh, charge out there and you just throw it on the charger. And you do that a few times. What happens is that the NICAD battery says, okay, well, uh, let's see, I'm only used about half the time. So I'm not going to provide all the power that's necessary. I'm only going to be used half the time. You really shorten your NICAD battery life by doing that, um, by not actually discharging your NICAD battery uh, or the NICAD battery pack fully. Um, once you do that a few times, and this, this is particularly true if the NICAD batteries are fresh and new. Once you do a, uh, a full initial charge and then do a full discharge and then recharge that battery, and you do that about two or three times, maybe even four times, that NICAD battery knows, it develops that memory and, under, and, and knows that uh, it's going to give you more life and more power. Um, only then, after then, can you actually throw the uh, battery pack on when it's half charged if you want a full charge for the following day. Not really a good practice, though, to do that. Continue to discharge your NICADs as much as possible. So you can change sunlight into voltage, and you can... Uh, notice the word volt, uh, you can do that using the term vo photovoltaic conversion. Well, we know what that is. That happens to, to be your little solar lights. Photo vo photovoltaic conversion is uh, the key word there. And the typical cell will yield about 0.5 volts of direct current. A solar panel of, is made up of a series of these parallel, made up of a series of series parallel connections of these cells in order to ch charge your storage battery system. How they're wired up uh, determines how much voltage the entire panel or the array is going to, uh, to put out for uh, your operation there. And there's a typical uh, solar panel with various cells in there, and they're all wired up accordingly. If you're the type that um, likes to, what in the world am I stepping on? Okay. Oh, my clip. Uh, if you're the type that likes to experiment and play around with uh, things like this and you want to get more knowledge, especially these photovoltaic or solar panels, um, if you have these little garden lights that light your sidewalk or your garden or whatever, um, they uh, charge your battery at during the day and they light up at night and once those things kind of go south and they're 
no longer any good, two things you can do. If you want to continue using it, you don't want to necessarily replace it. Uh, throw another rechargeable battery in there, or if might have one or two batteries in there. But if you don't want to do that, salvage the solar cell out of these little garden lights and uh, you have something to play with. You can put them all together. And if once you understand how these things operate a little bit, uh, you can make yourself a small portable charger. You can build yourself a little uh, uh, regulator circuit um, to, uh, to charge your batteries out in the field, uh, whatever you want to do. It's a nice, easy, and cheap way and to get uh, some solar cells if you want them. Ask your neighbors. Tell them not to throw away their solar, uh, their little solar garden lights. Tell them you want them. I have a bunch of them here. So, you know, um, I've been meaning to kind of sit down and play around with some of these and uh, make some portable chargers for uh, uh, for my cell phone and other electronic devices. And I uh, just haven't really gotten around to it. There's just been so much other stuff to do. But uh, just something to kind of keep in the mind to uh, uh, possibly do in the future. Grab them and play with them a little bit. So Gordo always likes to monitor solar power charging with a small amp meter in series with the red lead. And uh, you can really see how a single shadow will decrease output. Um, one night you check the panel and it's actually showing a discharge on your battery. There probably was no series diode to prevent the panel from slightly discharging your battery. Newer panels usually have the diodes in place, but some older panels or scavenged scavenged uh, panels uh, without a controller could really use that reverse current diode to prevent battery discharge. And like I said, that's one thing you can build if you happen across some uh, solar panels. I've got two of them in my garage that were salvaged uh, from uh, these uh, con construction uh, pieces of equipment. Like you see when you're driving down the road, uh, they have these little signs that say, you know, move right or slow down or bump ahead or whatever. Um, you might see some solar panels on them. And what they do, uh, if if they uh, get to a certain age, they might get rid of them. Fortunately, my panels uh, are in really good shape. And all I need to do is build a circuit um, to uh, to regulate the voltage into my battery and one of the things that's necessary to prevent the battery at nighttime from discharging is to make sure that you have a reverse current diode so that the battery doesn't discharge back into the solar panel. Okay, the wind doesn't blow all the time and we know that. I see these windmills up here uh, across the way from where I live and uh, there are times when those windmills don't turn at all, and they might not turn for days. But um, wind power is not necessarily a good primary source for your emergency communication station. Um, solar may be the same way as well. I've got several solar lights around here, uh, around my place, and they don't always charge. Uh, we, if we get days of really cloudy, overcast days, the uh, the batteries in those uh, solar lights uh, are not going to charge up properly. Um, the one light that's out by my back door never worked the whole winter. Um, now that we're getting some sunshine, it's working fine now. <laughs> so there you go. So when that wind isn't blowing, you need a huge bank of batteries to keep your station on the air. Same thing with solar power. As a general class operator, you'll probably re be running a 100 watt HF mobile transceiver in your car. Uh, you cannot rely on the car's 12 volt accessory or power port socket wiring to support the necessary 20 amp minimum power demands from your HF radio. So what you wanna do is wire your red and black power leads directly to the battery using heavy gauge wire and uh, make sure that you fuse both the red and black power leads close to the battery and uh, 
that way you'll protect your battery as well as your equipment um uh, one thing i noticed that when my battery got weak in my truck um the uh radio didn't want to work very well i always had to had to start up the uh the truck in order to provide the necessary power if i was running full power off my hf rig uh for it to uh to uh, actually operate properly So you, while you might be tempted to grab 12 volts from an automobile auxiliary power socket, don't. Uh, the radio will work for a few minutes, but after a little bit of transmitting, the auxiliary power receptacle wiring will get red hot by overdrawing current and quite possibly cause a fire in your dashboard. So plugging into your, it might be okay for your CB, um, which doesn't draw a whole lot of power. You m might get away with plugging that CB into your little uh, accessory port, what used to be called a cigarette or cigar lighter. Uh, but if you're running any type of power, it's always recommended anyway to directly wire your radio to the battery. And typically on the firewall, if you kind of look around on the outside and then get underneath your dash and look on the inside, there's typically some rubber plugs. There's holes that are already there, and those rubber plugs are there just to cover the holes. And all you have to do is just poke a hole in it and run your wires through, and you're good to go. Many plugs that attach to rep receptacles on your radio, including the uh, metal microphone plugs and jacks, have a protruding ridge or a channel so that the plug fits properly in the receptacle. In other words, it doesn't uh, there's only one way you can actually insert that connector. Uh, so it reduces the chance of accidentally bending fragile pins when you plug into the receptacle. So these are called keyed connectors. All right, we're going to get into some questions now and answers. Just the same thing we just covered. So I'm going to wet my whistle before I get going here again. You can follow along in the book. If you turn back to the page there. You can follow along in the book and you can answer them as we go. Or use your memory and answer them without looking at the book because it's not an open book exam. What would be the RMS voltage across a 50 ohm dummy load dissipating 1200 watts? Okay, if you remember your formula, okay, uh, or if you just memorize the answer, uh, answer B or 245 volts is uh, the correct answer there. Again, those can be switched around. <laughs> All right. How many watts of electrical power are used if 400 volt DC is supplied to an 800 ohm load? Again, through your working your formula and everything, um, you're you're multiplying uh, 400 by 400, dividing by 800, and you come up with B, 200 watts. How many watts of electrical power are used by a 12-volt DC light bulb that draws 0.2 amps? If you just remember your formula, it's so easy. All you're doing is you're multiplying 0.2 by 12 and you're coming up with 2.4 watts. How many watts are dissipated when, when the current of seven, how many watts are dissipated when a current of seven milliampers flows through 1.25 kiloohms resistance? Remember, you wanna change this to base units. You wanna change milliamps to amps, want to change kilo ohms to ohms. So by doing that, uh, you're moving for milliampers, you're moving your decimal point three spaces to the left. You come up with 0 0.007, and then you move uh, your decimal point for kilo ohms over three spots, and you come up with 1,250 ohms. And then using your formula, it will come up and give you 61 milliwatts.
which value of an AC signal results in the same power dissipation as a DC voltage of the same value. So it's the value of the AC signal. And uh, remember, this is called the root mean RMS value. Uh, root mean square, I didn't finish that, sorry. Um, what is the RMS voltage of a sine wave with a value of 17 volts peak? Remember how we changed that and did the, uh, the formula and everything. Predominantly speaking, it's the uh, same as your source, which is about 12 volts. So which of the following is an advantage of a switch mode power supply as compared to a linear power supply? Talking about the linear power supply being this big old heavy anchor, uh, the switch mode power supply, of course, um, allows you to use smaller components, smaller transformers, things of that sort. Careful of noise with those, though. Again, what it said, keep it away about 10 feet from your antennas. What portion of the AC cycle is converted to DC by a half wave rectifier? Only a hundred, only half of it, which is 180 degrees. A full wave, a full wave of an AC cycle is 360 degrees. So half of that is 180. What portion of the AC cycle is converted to DC by a full wave rectifier? And I just pretty much gave you that answer, all 360 degrees of the AC cycle. That's starting from the zero point, going all the way up, and then coming back to the zero point again, and then going down and coming back up to the, to the zero point. That is a full cycle, and it's 360 degrees, just like it's going around in a circle. What is the output waveform of an unfiltered full wave rectifier connected to a resistive load? The output waveform of an unfiltered full wave rectifier connected to a resistive load. You get a series of DC pulses is what you get. Kind of a ripple effect. It's not a smooth, pure uh, signal of DC going through there. And uh, it pulses at twice the frequency of the AC input, by the way. <clears throat> Let me back up here real quick and kind of explain this a little bit more, what it, what it means by twice the frequency of the AC input. Your normal AC uh, output is a 60 hertz sine wave. In other words, it cycles... Uh, 60 times per second. Uh, when you put that full wave bridge rectifier on there, it's going to pulse 120 times per second or twice the frequency of the AC input. What is the peak inverse voltage across the rectifiers in a full wave bridge power supply? The peak inverse voltage that is across the rectifiers in a full wave bridge power supply. Think about this real quick, and we're gonna give you the answer here in just a moment. It is equal to the normal peak output voltage of the power supply. That is your peak inverse voltage. So whatever the normal peak output voltage of the power supply is, uh, it's equal to the peak inverse voltage across the rectifiers in a full wave bridge power supply. So what is the peak inverse voltage across the rectifier in half wave power supply? And it's going to be, you got to be careful on this one. It's going to be twice or two times the normal peak output voltage of the power supply. Don't get confused with that. It's two times the normal peak output voltage. 
Which of the following components are used in a power supply filter network? Okay, when you look at this, uh, you're, you're looking at a power supply filter network, and it's only specifically talking about the filters that are in that power supply. So we talked about this before of what components actually help smooth out that pulsing DC uh, signal that comes in. It, you have something that actually takes part of that and stores it. Inductors help uh, oppose the uh, uh, some of the uh, reverse um, voltage that's in there. So the components that we use are capacitors and inductors. Which of the following is an advantage of an electrolytic capacitor? Okay, an electrolytic. We're talking especially about an electrolytic, not a ceramic uh, capacitor or any other type of capacitor. Uh, it's because it has a very high capacitance for a given volume. Why is the polarity of applied voltages important for a pol polarized capacitor? <laughs> well, when you look at it, if you have an incorrect pol polarity, it can cause the capacitor to short circuit. Uh, reverse voltages can destroy the dielectric layer of an electrolytic capacitor, and the capacitor could overheat and explode. So all of these choices are correct if it's not installed properly with the proper polarization. What is uh, What useful feature does a power supply bleeder resistor provide? Um, you wanna make sure that if you're gonna put your hands in there, that those capacitors, and these could be some pretty big capacitors, and they could hold some fairly decent charges, uh, enough to charge you, uh, give you a, a nice significant shock. So ensures that the filter capacitors are discharged properly when power is removed. So when you turn that power button off on your radio, you might see uh, the lights just slowly dim down. It only takes maybe a, a second or two, but they do slowly dim down. They don't go off uh, immediately. That's because there's still some voltage uh, potential existing in those capacitors. So that bleeder resistor is taking that potential out and it totally shuts down your rig after that and protects your fingers if you're going to get into it. Uh, what is an advantage of a digital voltmeter as compared to an analog uh, voltmeter? Actually, it had, you know, we, there's some other aspects about it. It does provide a, a higher um, uh, resistance so that it doesn't load down the circuit, but it is also better precision for most uses uses because of that. So it has better precision for most uses. What is an instance in which the use of an instrument with an analog readout may be preferred over an instrument with a digital readout? Uh, if you have an analog readout, but uh, you want to use you want to use a digital readout. Uh, it's it's particularly helpful when adjusting tuned circuits, because the digital, again, the digital uh, meter is not going to load down the circuit that you're measuring like an analog meter might do. Um, the uh, the analog meter has a lower input impedance and uh, can actually affect your reading. Uh, why is how, uh, high input impedance desirable for a voltmeter? Uh, again, it, it's just a, another rehash of some of the previous questions. It decreases the loading on circuits being measured. What is the minimum allowable discharge voltage for maximum life of a standard 12 volt lead acid battery? Using a standard car battery, you don't want it to go below 10.5 volts. When is it acceptable to recharge a carbon zinc primary cell? Uh, actually, the shortest answer on here, never. <laughs> you really don't want to do that. Um, 
you can really cause some problems there. And even if you manage to get some potential back into that uh, into that carbon zinc battery, you could cause some leakage uh, and damage to your electronic components um, by doing that. What is an advantage of the low internal resistance of NICAD batteries? The low internal resistance. Um, you got to think a bit about this a little bit because NICAD batteries have the ability. One thing about the, the NICAD batteries is that they will provide as much of full voltage as possible. It doesn't just decrease gradually. It does to, to a degree. But a NICAD battery will continue to provide as much of the maximum voltage it can possibly do this is why it caught this is why it has a memory effect um so by doing that and providing full power and then all of a sudden uh, your your power is gone um it, it's because it has a high discharge current uh that's and that's an advantage of the low internal resistance of your NICAD battery the high discharge current uh continues to provide you as close to the highest available voltage possible that that NICAD can put out. And then it just drops off immediately when it can no longer provide any power. What is the name of the process by which sunlight is changed directly into electricity? Remember that little uh, word photovoltaic? It's called photovoltaic conversion. What is the approximate open circuit voltage from a fully illuminated silicon photovoltaic cell? And uh, remember, that's just about a half a volt DC. That is the open circuit voltage. If you put that little cell out there, just that single cell, and you put sunlight on it, and you measure it with a voltmeter, preferably a digital one, you see about 0.5 volts DC. And one thing about those little uh, lights I was talking about earlier, those little garden lights, um, a lot of those little garden lights might have two or three uh, batteries in them. And of course, uh, those batteries are typically about one and a quarter to one and a half volts uh, of power. And in order for them to be charged, they have to have a little bit of a higher voltage um, from the solar cell uh, to... Uh, to actually charge the battery. So if you consider that it's a one and a quarter volts times three, uh, you're, you're putting out almost four volts from three cells in that to light that little light. So typically the amount of raw voltage that's available in those little solar built-in solar panels for those little lights is about six volts, anywhere from five to six volts. That provides a, uh, as much uh, power from full sun as it possibly can muster to make sure that those batteries internally are, are charged up. So what is the reason that a series diode is connected between a solar panel and a storage battery that is being charged by the panel? Uh, remember what that uh, series diode is going to do. If you don't have that series diode, then what happens is that your batteries are going to discharge. So the diode prevents self-discharge of the battery through the panel during times of low or no illumination. Which of the following is a disadvantage of using wind as the primary source of power for an emergency station? Well, uh, a large energy storage system is needed to supply power when the wind isn't blowing. Eh, and I'm going to say it's going to be the same for uh, a station when you're powering solar. If you have gray, overcast, cloudy skies, you're not going to get much power even out of the sun. But uh, the disadvantage of using wind for this answer is that you need a big storage system to supply power when the wind isn't blowing. So which of the following direct fused power connections would be the best for a 100 watt HF mobile in, uh, installation? You gotta remember that you've gotta use some pretty hefty wire for that, but you gotta go directly to the battery uh, using heavy gauge wire. 
And if you uh, can, if all possible, use Anderson connectors um, inside where the uh, radio hooks up. You run your wires directly from your from the radio to the battery. Um, you want some means to remove it, so put some Anderson connectors on there. Why is it best not to draw the DC power for a 100 watt HF transceiver from the vehicle's auxiliary power socket? Again, those power sockets, they're not designed to provide a whole lot of amperage or power to uh, uh, things like your 100 watt HF transceiver. Again, you can probably do it to a, for a CB, but uh, predominantly the socket's wiring may be very inadequate for the current being drawn by the transceiver. What is the main reason to use keyed connectors instead of non-keyed types? It will actually uh, prevent... What in the world did that thing just do? <laughs> It didn't turn red. Reduce the chance of incorrect mating, basically. So, very simple. I think we have an extra. Oh, it... there it goes. All right. It didn't kind of follow through properly. They kind of messed up that slide. All right. Um, so, that ends that. We're about 10 minutes after 8, 11 minutes after 8. And... Um, Got just some electronic symbols to kind of look at here um, of what they look like. We're going to cover a little bit of this in circuits tomorrow uh, or Monday evening, rather. Uh, the diode, capacitor, inductor, resistor, DC voltage, these are all um, things that, uh, and we covered the AND gate and AND gate with the digital circuits, the logic circuits, basically. These are electronic symbols for that. Uh, just kind of cover this real quick before we move on to grounds because it's a rather short one. These are what uh, different switches, uh, the diagrams you'll see on schematic diagrams of the different types of switches. Uh, there you have uh, what uh, a transformer would look like with the primary and secondary and your dielectric in the middle. Uh different things there that I that I pulled up for you guys. All right. Well, we don't need to look at that right now. All right. Any questions, Cohen, before I get on to the next one? Good to go. Thumbs up. Okay. Do, 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 do. We're going to cover grounds now, if I can find. Oops. There we go. Topic 15 is uh, talking about good grounds. Um, grounds can help uh, protect your equipment and uh, provide static discharge and things of that nature. And that begins over in do, 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 page, if you look in your book, page 162 where we'll get started. Do, 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 do. Once my PowerPoint slide comes up, I think I can get, get that done and to get my book squared away so the pages aren't flopping all over the place on my end. There we go. Do, 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 do. Slideshow from the beginning. Get my uh, cue window over here and get it ready. And away we go. CQ. <laughs> yeah, if you notice the little picture down there in the lower left hand corner. Guy's in his ham shack, mom's in there cooking, and all of a sudden she hears CQ 15, 15 <laughs> coming out of the toaster. I don't think that'll actually happen, but at any rate, as we get into this, um, 
there, you could experience some problems uh, if you receive an RF burn when touching your equipment while transmitting on an HF band. And I'll tell you that uh, that old radio of mine that I had when I first got licensed, that uh, Hallicrafters HT50 or HT40 transmitter, had no ground connection on the power cord. So the cabinet wasn't grounded. And I did receive my fair of of shocks off of that cabinet <laughs> and uh until i uh, actually grounded it so at any rate um this little funny story that uh, is here is uh you got and you're petting fido while going on the air with your new hf installation you see a blue arc from your d104 microphone to his metal name tag accompanied by a yelp welcome to rf floating along the chassis ground of your equipment using wire to ground hf equipment may create an antenna like circuit that looks like an open circuit to earth ground um so round ground wires may also behave like wire coils developing a reactance at specific frequencies and blocking the ground connection to the cold water pipe this blocking action is called impedance but you always want to ground your equipment with a flat braid or copper foil using the shortest run possible to an actual earth ground. That means driving an, er, a, a ground rod, an eight foot ground rod into the ground outside your ham shack and uh, running that copper flat braided um, wire out, out the window or through the wall or whichever way you possibly can do that and attaching it to that ground rod. That is your earth ground. So, and it says in some cases, this may not be uh, possible in such a situation. You might try a device called an artificial ground, which makes a low impedance series resonance circuit out of any ground wire you do have. And sometimes acquiring a good RF ground is an art form and may require patience and persistence. So a safe way to keep all of your equipment at the same potential is to run a strip of copper foil at the rear of your station operating desk and then one small one inch wide copper foil tags going to each radio and accessory. These tags should be long enough to allow you to pull out the equipment for servicing and then uh, accordion up when you push the gear back in place. Connecting all of your equipment grounds together in this way, which is a procedure known as bonding, will help keep that stray RF out of your station. Key things to look here. Um, <clears throat> all of your copper foil ground connections go to a single ground point. Even though you have several uh, piece of, uh, pieces of equipment, you want all of them to go to a ground, a single ground point. Uh, the flattened copper pipe show, goes through the wall and into the earth. Uh, you can actually do that if you go and buy copper pipe at the uh, hardware store, flatten it out, and uh, and run it out the best way you can, um, and then connect it to a grounding point inside on the wall uh, that you're going to run all your grounds to. Down there on the lower right, you see kind of a pictorial of how this is actually accomplished. Um, you've got uh, the heavy gauge copper braid, and then you got a copper pipe, a flattened copper pipe that goes uh, through the wall. And then you have another heavy gauge copper ba uh, braid attached to it on the outside and then into the ground rod. Um, so when you get on the air for the first time and everyone reports you sound loud and sort of clear, but with a hum behind your signal, uh, you could be having a ground loop situation. 
and it can be cured with good copper foil grounding interconnected to each other and every piece of metal equipment you have on your desk. If you notice a tingle when you touch anything metal on your equipment during transmit, it's a sign that a resonant ground connection is causing high voltage to back up onto the case of the radio. A um, little bit of that tingle. Uh, that shows the three inch wide copper foil here. And that can go a long way to minimize or to eliminate that uh, problem, the resonant, uh, uh, the resonant ground connection that causes high voltage. I'm not going to read all of this. Generally speaking, um, I want to look at the uh, the question itself, however, in my book. So we're looking for a symptom of a transmitted RF being picked up by an audio cable carrying AFSK data signals between a computer and a transceiver. And... Um, We're looking to minimize any type of interference on there. Um, any conductor, such as a microphone cable, computer data cable, or your transmission line, if it's not properly decoupled, can be an antenna. Um, the problem here is the audio can keep your Vox keyed and create distortion or do a number uh, on digital signals. And really what you might need to do is add a few ferrite beads slipped over your suspected cables and eliminate some of that. Let's say for instance, and this has happened before, your neighbor calls up, he knows you're a ham radio operator and uh, his telephone, he's hearing voices coming through his telephone, even though the phone is on the hook. And what's happening there is while you're transmitting, the telephone cord at your neighbor's house is acting as, a t an, as an antenna. It may be just about the same resonant length of the signal you're, uh, of the frequency you're transmitting on. And so the cord is picking that up and it's coming into the phone and it's being rectified and being transmitted out uh, as an audio signal on the handset of the phone. By adding a few ferrite beads uh, to the telephone cable closest to the telephone will help eliminate that. And it's not a bad idea to put those uh, on both ends of that telephone cable, but at least one end closest to the telephone will help uh, uh, eliminate that. When you begin operating on general class frequencies, your powerful HF single sideband transceiver is fed into a rooftop antenna system. It will probably create audio frequency interference to your home electronics and those of your neighbors. You can also use bypass capacitors. Uh, they're usually 0 0.01 millifarads, uh, millifarads, microfarads, I'm sorry, microfarads, uh, and will sometimes help minimize this problem when strategic, strategically placed across and onto speaker wires and wiring harnesses inside the affected home. It's not a cure-all, but bypass capacitors are your first step in resolving interference complaints on a case by case basis. So remember that as well. Bypass capacitors. Have some bypass capacitors and some ferrite beads uh, available in your inventory if you can possibly do that. You can usually get those through uh, places like Mauser Electronics or DigiKey or uh, any number of um, electronic supply houses. Uh, you can find online now that we don't have radio shacks anymore.
Okay, you can get some terrific audio DSP speakers to add on to older equipment that does not have audio DSP capability. If the speakers are amplified, sometimes RF transmit sounds uh, come out over the speaker itself. So if you're using one of those, you can minimize or even eliminate this by placing ferrite beads around the cable. And there you have a picture of ferrite uh, bead around the audio cable um, running between uh, your um, speaker and your rig. Uh, also around your computer and data cables are not a bad idea to have on there as well. Single sideband sounds like distorted speech coming over a public address system or certain home electronics. However, double sideband AM CB radio type transmissions usually come through loud and clear, so these are easily distinguished from single sideband ham transmissions. If someone says you're causing interference, ask the question, does it sound clear or does it sound garbled? If they say it sounds clear, you can probably eliminate you as being the suspe uh, suspected interference problem. Uh, but you should also help your neighbor and say, look, I, uh, I understand you're having this problem. I'm going to help you out a little bit here. But it sounds to me like what you're really uh, um, experiencing is interference from maybe a CB radio somewhere or somebody broadcasting AM. Um, but either way, be sure to be prepared to help your neighbor resolve the problem. Okay, CW transmissions come over uh, a PA or home electronic systems as on and off humming or clicking sounds. So there is no mistaking the sound of CW. If your neighbor says or if you experience this on and off clicking sound, and you're operating CW, you know you're the problem. About once every six months, uh, go around and tighten up all the connections on the ham equipment. Uh, most important is the tightening up of the copper ground foil connections to the back of the rig. So an intermittent RF ground will sometimes create broadband radio frequency noise. Think about this, an intermittent RF ground will sometimes create broadband radio frequency noise and it will magically go away as soon as you give that nut a little clockwise crank and tighten it up a little bit. If you notice on page 164 in your book, um, Gordon has been so kind to provide a contact and address for that three inch wide uh, copper foil. You can get it in uh, 25 and 50 foot sections. So maybe if you know a few hams that might need it, get together and uh, all of you uh, order some. All right, next question. The noise blankers on most HF mobile transceivers do a very nice job of getting rid of spark plug pops, but right where you want to operate on the Gordon neck frequency of 7250, you hear a steady raspy carrier that only goes away when you shut off the ignition. Well, guess what? It may be your vehicle's onboard computer because sometimes these computer noises go all the way up into the two meter band as well. Relocating the antenna may help, and um, he's heard of vehicle computer interference on the VHF and UHF bands. Uh, luckily, uh, you almost never hear of this problem down on HF. So if you do experience some problems like that, um, some uh, raspy carrier signals could be your vehicle's onboard computer. All right, we're gonna get into the ground Q&A session here. Move right, moving right along. What might be the problem if you receive an RF burn when touching your equipment while transmitting on an HF band, assuming the equipment is connected to a ground rod? What might be the problem? Well, 
you got to think about the ground wire uh, having a high impedance on that frequency um, as being the problem. Even though it's grounded, the ground wire itself could have a high impedance on that frequency. So you're going to want to probably fix that with something different. So a good way to avoid unwanted effects of stray RF energy in an amateur station is to connect all your equipment grounds together, A. Okay, come on. There we go. How can a ground loop be avoided? Um, referring to the previous question, connect all your ground conductors to a single point. Make sure they're all connected together. They run to a single point. You got that copper uh, tube that runs along the back of your operating desk and it goes through the wall. And that copper tube, each piece of equipment is connected to that copper tube using uh, copper, braided, um, copper braided wire. What could be a symptom of a ground loop somewhere in your station? Okay, if you have a ground loop and somebody says, hey, you got some hum on your signal, that could be an indication of a ground loop somewhere. And what, can, uh, what effect can be caused by a resonant ground connection? You might get HF or you might get a high RF voltages on the enclosures of the station equipment if you have a resonant ground. Which of the following can be a symptom of transmitted RF being picked up by an audio cable carrying AFSK data signals between a computer and a transceiver? What is your symptom? Okay. Um, if you look at this, the symptom, be, you, when you're using, when you're doing digital modes, you're probably going to be using a Vox circuit of some sort. So a Vox circuit does not unkey the transmitter um, if you are picking up um, some stray RF. The transmitter signal may also be distorted, and frequent connection timeouts could be occurring on your uh, digital signal. So all of these choices are correct. Which of the following might be useful in reducing RF interference to audio frequency devices? Uh, you want to make sure that you're trying to reduce uh, RF interference to audio frequency devices. And one way to do that is with a bypass capacitor. Which of the following would reduce RF interference caused by common mode current on an audio cable? The other methodology, uh, other than a bypass capacitor, would be placing a ferrite bead around the cable. What sound is heard from an audio device or telephone if there is interference from a nearby single sideband phone transmitter? Remember, you're going to ask that neighbor, is it clear or is it distorted? And if he says distorted speech, then you know you are the problem and the source of that interference. What is the effect on an audio device or telephone system if there is interference from a nearby CW transmitter? Remember what that CW, when you're, when you're doing CW uh, or Morse code, you're doing an, uh, an on and off, so it's going to be an on and, on and off humming or clicking sound. And which of the following could be a cause of interference? Uh, covering a wide range of frequencies. And we're talking about a whole bunch of frequencies here. And uh, predominantly speaking, um, if you look at C, an arcing at a poor electrical connection. Arcing will go all across the spectrum practically. Which of the following may cause interference to be heard on the receiver of an HF radio installed in a recent model vehicle? Again, think about this recent model vehicle. Um, if, you're, uh, if you're getting a, a pulsing noise, 
uh, you your noise blanker is probably going to uh, clear that up. But if you're getting a different type of, of noise on there, it could be very much your vehicle control computer causing a problem on there. So with that, we kind of wrap it up a little bit. And um, do, 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 do. I'm going to show me here. If uh, anyone has any questions, they're more than welcome to send me an email. Uh, just send it to wayne at n3lms.net. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up the broadcast portion. Uh, but if Cohen has a, a question that might be of interest to others, we'll ask Cohen if he has a, has a question there. You got anything for us, Cohen? No, I'm good. Are you? Okay, well, I'm going to stop the broadcast. <laughs>